Welcome back. You are listening to the It's Never Too Late to Be Healthy podcast, and I'm your host, Kevin Brady. Through my own experiences as a lifelong athlete, community volunteer, author, and company founder, I'm on a mission to educate, inspire, and motivate individuals of all ages to improve all aspects of their health and live their best life to the fullest. I built my company, Advoca Health, based on this mission. Advoca Health assists companies and individuals navigate the very best health solutions both at home and in the world. On this podcast, I meet with industry leading experts and partners with the aim to share simple strategies and tips to help you live a healthier, longer, and happier life. Sit back and enjoy the show. Good day, everyone, and welcome to It's Never Too Late to Be Healthy podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brady. Today, we have a real treat for you. Uh, My guest on today's show is Fina Scropo. Best way I can describe Fina is she's a publisher, she's an editor, she's a communicator, but more importantly, she's an amazing storyteller. She has helped so many people share their stories through the 35 books that she has helped people get over the finish line. She actually helped me uh, with my own book in terms of publishing, editing, cover design, and all those details that we don't even think about when we, uh, when we set on an endeavor to write a book. Today, we talk about her career, some of the misconceptions or misbeliefs about publishing a book, the importance of food to healthy living, and we talk about her own book, The Healthy Italian. And lastly, we finish with the importance of food and celebrating food with family. Dina, welcome to the It's Never Too Late to Be Healthy podcast. I'm so excited to be here, Kevin. You've you've turned the tables on me today. I'm usually the one who's asking the questions. So it's uh, it's a refreshing change. Well, you know what? I was thinking uh, just in anticipation of the podcast, how we basically were talking, if not every day, every second day or every third day for a while there. And for our listeners, uh, Fina is the the reason I got our my latest book over the finish line. So thank you, uh, Fina. But I do uh, miss our uh, daily and weekly interactions that we had going there for a while. No, I, I think when people start writing a book, they don't anticipate the experience of you know, uh, making it a full-time project, even if it be, if it's a side project or a passion project, it really becomes something that's consuming, but in a good way, right? Because you're passionate about it. You get very involved. There's lots to do and you build relationships along the way, um, and rapport. And I, and I miss that too. I, I, I really enjoy working with clients on books because I know how much work and how much passion they put into it. And it's nice to have somebody to bounce ideas off of once in a while, especially if we're working in a silo, especially over these times where we've all been working at home and on screens. Um, It's nice to have some interaction um, that's a little different on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, well, and your your track record uh, speaks for itself. I understand you've uh, helped publish and edit over 35 books, which is... uh, and, and somehow you made me feel like I was the only project you were working on. <laughs> <laughs> I started at five and worked my way up. No, um, yeah, no, I've been very fortunate and very grateful to have been involved with so many projects and so many incredible people along the way with so many interesting topics, you know, in a way, it's my, it's my opportunity to learn about the world through other people's stories, through other people's eyes, through other people's experiences. So I highly recommend, you know, um, if, if someone's looking for a career change in terms of guidance and training and teaching and coaching and editing, um, it's a great wor- way to learn about the world and around, you know, the topics and the experiences around us. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can speak from experience. I mean, I think I shared the story with you that I thought the real work was just writing the book, uh, which I think I had probably finished or close to finished about a year before you and I met. And uh, then I realized that the real work, and I remember you saying that to me, you go, no, no, the real work is after the book's written. And I never fully understood that until, until this book. Yeah. And you know what? At the same time, to be fair, um, 
editors don't always tell the whole story until you're in it because we don't want to intimidate you know we want the creative juices to keep flowing and get you over the finish line and writing the book but the magic does happen when you are collaborating with an editor who puts some spark perhaps some references you hadn't thought about some perspectives and gets you to rethink you know um sometimes it's even at the beginning right it's not only you, you were lucky in that you got to that point uh in your in your development your book development of of having written um sometimes it's pulling that story you know as an editor uh and the writer working together is pulling that story along the editor the writer just either stumbles over their own words hits a writer's block doesn't know where to go and the editor has to really dig deep and find you know that sort of creative flow again to get the writer going um but it's it's a process it definitely is a process um like anything right like you know in healthcare right your own journey right it's a process you don't get to the finish line um by saying okay i'm you know let's let's get this going and in a day or two it's done it's it really is a long journey but but the journey is rewarding along the way yes there's ups and downs but think of the accomplishments right think of all those sort of blocks and all those obstacles that you had to overcome to get this book to market the same way as somebody changing their life um in a good way in a positive way right whether it's health or whether it's um you know uh just relationships whatever it is um it it does require a process and there are certain milestones that you have to look towards to be able to get there yeah yeah for sure well I, and i've mentioned this to you fina like there's no way i would have published the book without you so i want to personally uh thank you for uh, helping <laughs> get across that finish line. It was awesome. Well, I I'm grateful. Thank you for allowing me to be on your journey. Um that's really what it is, right? It's 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 holding your hand through the journey. Um and teaching me about things that I never knew about and that have inspired me um about your story and about your book. Um it's it's been a wonderful experience. Yeah, good. Good. So, since we're on the book, um I know I have my views on it, but what what would you say are a, a few of the I'll say misconceptions or assumptions that people have when they when they say, "Okay, I'm going to write a book." Like what are, you know, I and I I can speak from experience myself, but I'd like your input on, you know, what are kind of the the top things that you hear that people go, "Oh, I never I wasn't aware of that or I didn't know about that or or whatever." Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question because uh I hear it a lot, you know. I hear a lot of people saying, "Oh, I want to write a book one day" or "I've got a book in me. I've got a story to tell," you know. And we all have stories to tell. And I encourage people to write and to journal and to do whatever it is to share their stories. Use different medias to do that. But when you're talking about a book, you know, because of the work that we just described, the 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 obstacles we're facing, all those things the process we have to go through is understanding why do you want to write a book you know what's the purpose what's the passion do you want to tell a story that you think is relevant and will inspire people in their own lives like you've done is it an extension of a business card um because you you do something full time and you really want this as a complement to the current work that you're doing is it a passion you know is it something unique I mean there's a lot of reasons a lot of good reasons why you write a book but really understanding what it is you want to write because that will influence everything else right that'll influence what voice and what tone are you using what are what's the kind of information you're going to include the book what is the book going to look like how is it going to feel i always talk about feel i like that tactile cuz when we're talking about books for me it's a very tactile experience what is that book going to feel like what is it going to you know what kind of sort of reaction or emotion is it going to draw because it is an emotional connection um so you know the desire to tell a story may not be enough you really have to you know do the work and understand what it is you want to accomplish with this book i mean i uh, some authors will say i don't know i just sat down one day and it came and that's that's a gift <laughs> i have to say even yeah. for a professional writer and editor like me it's a gift um but for the for the majority of us that's not the case and we've got to work at it and uh and so starting at that would be a good idea of course 
once you understand that, then it's planning the time and making the commitment. You know, it's not just, um, well, I'm going to write and I'm sure as I write, it will come. Right. <laughs> right, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> How, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, you wish. Right. It's it. Th that doesn't happen. You know, th th even for the professionals, there are um, there are things that we have to plan when we're writing. We have to make a commitment, perhaps it's an hour commitment a day. Perhaps it increases as you get closer to the finish line. Um, what does it mean in terms of our schedule? How are we gonna schedule those blocks of time? Because if we lose too much time in between, we might lose our train of thought or we might lose the creative flow or the inclination or the inspiration, right? So that's important. Um, so you know, a work back, I live by my work back schedules. Um, I, wanna, I wanna markers to at least keep me on task to be able to meet those deadlines. So that's really important. And, you know, I'm gonna be biased here. An editor is important. And I'm not just saying that because I'm an editor. It's, it's all the things we talked about, right? It's, you know, removing yourself from the process is important because you need perspective and helping people, someone find your voice. Because sometimes that book, as you come in and out of it so many times, you can bring different voices. You can bring different tenses. I think that happened with your book. Totally. Where... Yeah, for sure. Because I because it wasn't like I sat down and just wrote the whole book. It was over probably the course of a year. Right? Yeah, and... right. So for sure, the tenses, the the dialogue, the it does change because along the way, you pick up different perspectives and you bring in different styles and you learn a thing or two about writing or how you want to improve your writing. And so that the, the editor can really add, and it adds credibility and it adds motivation. And there's a lot of different good reasons why I'm not going to oversell it, but I, but I do think it's important. I had, um, I had the pleasure of working with a lot of great people, but I had uh, one um, client in particular um, where I had the opportunity to work on five of her books. Um, she was, she's awesome. I don't think she's done writing by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, she always said that 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 the the value of an editor is important um, to her process, and it and it encouraged her to keep writing. So I think I think that's important too. And the biggest one, um, I shouldn't say the biggest, as important as make as writing a good book um, is marketing. <laughs> yeah. um, and we forget about that, right? It's really important. A great book, and now what? How are you going to reach? How are you going to get it out there? How are you going to reach the right target? Who's going to know about it? Um, where does your target audience live? How are you going to approach them? You know, and, and it's and it's all the great things you're doing with your book. Um, you know, is it um, developing distribution channels? What do they look like? Are they the traditional Amazon Indigo chapter um, type channels? Is it in Walmart? Is it in other retailers? Does it make sense for your audience? Maybe your audience lives somewhere else. You know, are they on? Are they on socials? On, on dig, is it a digital marketing program that you have to buy into, which obviously in this day and age is, is probably a very important consideration. So how do you reach them? You really have to, to understand um, marketing um, and kudos to you because you got it from day one that this was something we had to focus our energies on. And, um, and part of the marketing plan is also developing that network, right? It's as important for you to develop a strong network to be able to have those soldiers spread the word, right? Because you're one person and there's only so much one person can do. And yes, um, you know, if you're a Kardashian, perhaps <laughs> you, might, you might have an instant following, but um, you know, you want, you want that network to really um, help you spread the word. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot there. And uh, what, what would you say if somebody would ask you from start to finish, uh, how long does it take to write out to write a from? I've got the idea, I'm going to write a book to get it out there. And I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, and it depends on the author. And it depends on your support network. And it depends on the process. And it depends on the book. And like, there's a lot for sure, a lot of different um, things you have to consider a lot of considerations for sure. Um, you know, I had one, um, I remember it was at an award ceremony and a writer who was awarded a gold award, got up on stage and said, thank you so much. It took me, you know, I, I barricaded myself and I pumped this out in 17 days and I just almost fell over. And I thought, how, but you know, he had also written 10 other books <laughs> 
And he also had a team behind him. And he also afforded the opportunity of barricading himself and so on and so forth. So that's possible, unlikely, but possible. For most of us, it takes a good year and a half to really get the story down, to develop it. You know, remember, even, even when you've written the book, there's all those editing stages, right? A good number of editing stages um, to be able to go back and refresh and add and layer in that content. So an hour and a half, excuse me, a year and a half is typical. And then, you know, it just depends on the editor and how close you work with the editor and how much work it, it involves and the team behind you. So I, I'd say work with 18, an 18 month schedule, do a work back and see if that makes sense for you. And of course, you know, there's times where you speed that up and there's times where you need more time because life goes on. And sometimes, you know, you're pulled into things that didn't, you didn't expect to be pulled into and require more time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I'll ask you uh, to summarize, what, what would you say is the number one um, misconception that people have? um when they when they go down the path of writing a book ah oh, jesus lots <laughs> <laughs> um i'm going to say that because they've worked so hard at the book and they're so close to it and they're so passionate that they feel that everybody will see that and unfortunately they don't always see that right unfortunately um, you do need that plan in place. You do need the marketing in place. You do need other people and your network, your friends, your family to spread the word. Obviously, you know, you have to get behind the book and you have to be as passionate about it from, you know, day 365 to from, from day one, you know, like, and, and, and every, anything in between, you have to really be passionate about it every single way, um, every step of the way. Um, so I, I think people have the misconception that my work is done. It's a great book and it probably is, but you know, it, it will not sell itself without some hard work behind that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's what I, if you were to ask me, I would say, I would, I would echo that just saying, yeah, when the book's written, it, you're not done. There's so much more to it. Right. And, you know, you know, at the end there, I think we were, we were having meetings, uh, the three of us, Vanessa, yourself and myself. I don't know, every week for sure, minimum once a week. So, for yeah. sure, for sure, to keep everybody on task. And and yeah, that, that network of people to help you is definitely important. Um, I would, yeah, I would say that, you know, if you can do that early on and get a team and get resources and get people behind you and build that network, um, that's really important. And some people have the benefit of having that network already in place. I mean, you know, so some people might say, well, it didn't take me a year and a half and the marketing uh, efforts were a lot more sort of tighter than what you're talking about. They may have work, say, as a blogger or as an influencer or as somebody in their work. They may have worked that, you know, to get to that point may have been years of work where they were developing a personal brand. They were developing a voice. They were developing an audience. And so if you've got that, wonderful you know you've already got that platform so be able to so to be able to bring whatever you know over those years you've learned and you've developed to interact with an audience and you bring it to a book it may take you a shorter amount of time it may set you up nicely um, there's still work to be done but some of those things were already done but that I still consider that process part of the book process because in some ways, people who are influencing or blogging are thinking about that as an opportunity to open doors for other opportunities. And one of them being a book. You know, everybody I think who, who has a story to tell, um, think about, you know, the presidents and the prime ministers and all, you know, all those people who've been in public office or have been at a corporation or who have implemented some kind of system. They want to be able to tell their story. Um, beyond just, you know, a minute or two in an interview. So those are the kind of things that will definitely set you up for success. Yeah, for sure. And I, again, I can speak firsthand because uh, as I said, I would not, we would not have the finished product if it wasn't for you, Phoenix. Thank you for that. Well, listen, it, it's, it's as much for me an accomplishment as it is for my writers, because I feel like I fail them if I haven't brought them to market or I haven't set them up for success. Um, and I think that's why I, I choose my projects very carefully as well. 
I, I take great care and, and um, thankfully having the opportunity to sometimes even choose the people I want to work with because um, I want to work with great people. I want to work with great stories and I don't want to let them down. So I want to be able to give them the amount of time and the amount of energy and the amount of expertise I need to, to, to do to be able to see them succeed. So um, I, I, I'm just as thrilled. <laughs> it, it shows it shows for sure in working with you and i and the energy that uh, our listeners can feel right now through your voice is the same energy you had every time i talked to you so awesome. <laughs> yeah oh. no it's I, i'm lucky i'm lucky yeah. for sure to to have brought all that together yeah. yeah good um let's step back a bit like how did you even get into publishing editing the, the book world and, and uh then we'll also talk about your own book as well yeah. Um, you know, it, um, I, I knew from a very young age, I, it was about storytelling. Um, I, I, I was, I was shy as a kid. So to be able to tell my story and to put myself forward was something that I wasn't used to and wasn't comfortable with. It was just, it was kind of my upbringing. So I loved sharing other stories and I loved helping people share their stories. So I knew very early on my career path was going to be journalism and I graduated from journalism and it was an incredible experience and a wonderful experience. And so, you know, throughout my career, I, um, I started in medical publishing, funny enough, in uh, McLean Hunter back in the, the big publishing house and um, really got to understand and appreciate medical writing, um, health writing, and uh, from that experience, went on to uh, work a few other publications and then went freelance about 21 years ago. And as I was doing some freelance work and, do, and still doing a lot of magazine work, which was primarily my focus, I really enjoyed books. I started to really get into books and I had the great fortune of working with gurus like David Chilton, the, who is the wealthy barber, who is like the guru of self-publishing and Greta Janet Podleski, who are dynamos when it came to self-publishing cookbooks and you know th those are all kind of integrated into um, the kind of work that I was doing and um, as I was doing more and more self-published books more and more people learned about the work that I did um, the publishing world was very defined you know it was publishing and it was self-published and the two really didn't the two didn't help each other out although it's very different right now and there weren't that many platforms and there wasn't that much you know um I guess, specialty in that. So I started helping writers uh, bring their bo books to market. And then I started to learn myself about, you know, the, the, um, the channels, the, the avenues to get a book to market. And so it became uh, something I was very passionate about and learned to do sometimes through trial and error and sometimes through, you know, writing the coattails of, of gurus that I mentioned. And how they did it and, and setting using that model and then replicating it with some of the writers that I worked with. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, and you don't just do that for others. As I said, you've got your own book, uh, The Healthy Italian, right? So can you share a bit about that along your, your path and, and why you wrote the book? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Yeah, The Healthy Italian happened um, many, many, I'm going to say decades ago in my mind. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's not just writing and sitting and, and, and doing. It's, it's something that lives in your mind for a long time. I think a, a lot of writers, I think you, you said the same, that, you know, it was a book that was in you for a long time. And, um, uh, you know, it, helping, there were, there were two, I think there were two real reasons why, it, at least initially, I wanted to do it. Initially, because as I was helping self-published authors, you know, things were always changing in the marketing world, especially. And I wanted to learn how to do it myself. I, I obviously consulted, I coached them, I took them through the journey. But when you really sit in a place and you do it yourself, boy, do you learn. Yeah, <laughs> um, so I, I really wanted to sit in it. You know, I wanted to sit in it. I wanted to feel it. I wanted to own it. I wanted to tell about it because that was part of the story for me. So I decided I was going to write a book. And, and at first it wasn't a cookbook. It was like a health book. It was sort of a journey. And I was telling it through somebody else's eyes. And, and I just thought, well, you know, I, I kind of shifted focus. And I thought, I love cooking. I love teaching people to cook healthier. 
Um, I, we can get into sort of my upbringing and my background, but um, uh, I, every time I shared a, a, a recipe, especially an Italian recipe, something that was traditional and made it healthier, people are like, this, this is pretty good. This is great. I never thought to do this. Or my mom's always made it this way. I just always made it that way. I never thought to, you know, uh, exchange millet with rice or, you know, put barley instead of, you know, rice in a risotto, that kind of thing. And so I thought, okay, this is a personal passion. I think, I think I can do this. So um, I sat down, I started writing down all the recipes and I had more than enough of them. And then when I brought the stories to it, it became, it was one of the hardest things actually bringing the stories to the recipes, believe it or not. Usually it's the other way around for most people, writing the recipes is difficult, but the stories got very personal and it was something I wasn't used to. Again, I always told the stories through other people's eyes. And now the spotlight was on me and sharing my stories. And I really had to dig deep and find my own voice. Um, and that was all at the same time when, you know, Instagram started to come about and people were starting to develop their own personal brands. So while I was doing this book, my personal brand was developing a little bit. And I had to kind of find my place in the whole sort of influence spectrum. And that was an incredible journey as well. So the Healthy Italian came about. Um, because I was, you know, basically a busy mom trying to make, you know, trying to balance life who wanted to tell a story, who wanted to inspire people like me, who were in my same sort of filling my same, the same shoes I was filling, trying to get a healthy meal on the table, preserving and, um, honoring the traditions that I was brought up with and yet doing it in an approachable and an accessible and a healthy way so that I would then in turn inspire my family to, to do the same. So a lot of what you did, Kevin, like just in a different way, right? Yours, yours came in in a different way. My, mine came in through the kitchen, you know, through food and the love of food. But really, I think ultimately we're doing the same thing. You know, we're inspiring people to take a look at something that, obviously influences not only their personal health, but their family's health and the community around them. And, um, and just look at, look at it from a different lens and finding accessible, approachable ways like your four, four wheels of health at approaching these things, things that something that people can do quite easily for themselves. Yeah, no, that's interesting. The, uh, the parallels, cause I actually hadn't thought of that, but at the end of the day, I think both of us are just trying to inspire others to lead healthier, happier lives. Right. hundred percent, a hundred percent. That's exactly right. And, and your four wheels of health to me are kind of a foundation are, um, the same kind of foundation, I think for a lot of us trying to get out there, inspire, inspiring people to live a healthier, happier, more fulfilled life. Right. And these are the, the, the basics, the foundation or the core of what it means to live a healthy life. Um, and all these things are important and I, they're equally important for me. And they're equally important when I go on the road and I talk about my own journey and my book and where that book fits into those, those wheels, those spokes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Fina, would you mind sharing what is your, like if your, your backstory, I'll call it, or, or your family, obviously food is super important to you. Healthy eating is super important to you. Yeah. You know, shared that you you know, the reason you did it was to get the, your story out there. But so what, uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'm sure it goes way back. So if you wouldn't mind. Your story, <laughs> How uh, far back do you want me to go? No, <laughs> I'll, I'll be kind. I'll be kind to the listeners. Um, <laughs> No, it's, um, yeah, no, without a doubt, we're foodies. Um, there's a lot of different influences that have shaped my own um, experiences in the kitchen and the book itself and the cooking classes that I now do and those kinds of things. So, you know, my journalism career obviously influenced the kind of book I was writing in terms of structure and format. Um, my dad, my mom and dad are from Sicily in Italy. Um, it's the most beautiful. Southern Island. Yeah. It's the most yeah, Southern it's Island. Places. Yeah. Beautiful. Right. I mean, did you, did you do a bike ride? Did you do a cycle? I, um, I did. Uh, I was in, I, I, I do a race over in Sardinia. Oh, uh, in Sardinia. Uh, right. But, uh, we went to Sicily after Sardinia one year, my wife and I, Barbara and I. Yeah. Right. Right. So, you know, that those islands are 
they're a haven for Mediterranean foods and um, all things. I mean, the things that grow there and the, the, the accessibility of that kind of food was is just amazing. So I had my dad and mom who influenced and um, our cooking because at, at our at the heart of our cooking was Mediterranean ingredients. Um, and so that gave me a really good foundation of what to cook because, uh, you know, when we think about Italian cooking, we don't always think about Mediterranean cooking. You know, we think about like maybe the creams and the things that we've Americanized in terms of Italian cooking, you know, loads of cheese and loads of sauces and butter that are really not inherently part of the Italian cuisine. You know, they're, um, they're small things. And when we talk about Mediterranean cooking, at its heart, you know, there are really healthy ingredients. There's things like legumes and lentils and nuts and seeds and uh, tomatoes and citrus and herbs and, you know, fish and little meat. So um, I was lucky to have that foundation um, that influenced my own repertoire, if you will. But my dad, um, being from that agricultural background in Sicily, when he landed here in 57, he worked at the Ontario Food Terminal. Uh, so, right. So he got firsthand, whatever was being shipped here, the Ontario food terminal was the place, um, that distributed and that grocery stores sent their trucks to, to pick up daily produce. So he saw it all. He was, he was really, you know, the, the, and he got very excited. I mean, as passionate as I am about food, my dad's like triple passionate. He wow. just loves, loves. And, and back in the day, you know, I always tell this to my kids and to younger generations you know, now we can walk into a store and we can buy herbs, fresh herbs at any time, right? All season long, all four seasons, most times. That wasn't the case back then. You know, it was whenever it grew here, or whenever it grew somewhere where it can be transported here in like a very short amount of time, we got it. Otherwise, you had to wait till it was in season. So my dad, whenever things came in, especially at the start of a season, like, for example, artichokes or cardoons, which were very Mediterranean for us and hard to get, things like that, you know, he'd be so excited. He'd bring bags home of produce that just came in and really inspired us to think about creatively what to do with them. So that, that was great. That was another influence. And then my sister, um, I have a twin sister, an identical twin sister. So... Yeah. So um, genetically, you know, we're the same, um, if you will, in terms of science. But uh, 28 years ago, she was diagnosed with celiac disease. And um, we know what to do uh, now with a diagnosis like that. We have to eat gluten free, in some cases, dairy free and soy free, depending on, you know, what your body is, um, is going to be able to process. And back then, you know, it was like a death sentence for Italians, <laughs> like no bread, no pasta. Like, what are you yeah. talking about? Like, <laughs> we live on that. Um, but, you know, we, we didn't have the access to gluten-free products. Uh, to be honest, the medical team that diagnosed her barely knew anything about celiac disease. You know, talk about, you know, Advoca and what they provide as a resource I wish we had that back then because we were, we were searching for answers. We were looking, we were knocking on doors and, you know, we, things were starting to be understood about the disease, but, you know, I had to, because I worked downtown, I had to go to sick kids hospital to get her food. Um, if it was anything that was boxed like pasta or anything that was like a basis for her, um, her meal planning. And so, you know, for my mom, it was a real, it was a real challenge. You know, she didn't want to sit. I don't think you're any different than most families out there. We don't want to sit at the table where some of us can enjoy the foods that we eat, right? Where there's limitations or, right? We have to cut somebody out of the, the whole experience because part of the experience or the appreciation of preparing a meal is to enjoy it, to share it, and to be with each other while we're doing that. And so here we were with this conundrum, like, she can't have that. She can't have the pasta we eat. She can't have the pizza we eat. You know, we, we can't have, you know, chicken cutlets with the breading that we've been using. So my mom had to think creatively. Like she was, she was like one of your first alternative chefs. <laughs> she, she had to think on her feet. She was really good at that. And um, I got to know a lot about alternative cooking. 
and experimenting and alternative ingredients. So um, that was that was something that really influenced my cooking and in turn influenced the kind of traditional meals I brought to the table. And have you always loved cooking then? Is that like, a, obviously that's your passion, but it's like from a young age, were you, you know, were you one of these people, ladies that we are girls, I should say that was in helping okay. them cook the meals, prepare the meals. Yeah. Hanging around with grandma and mom and, and whomever. Now, to be fair, yes, I was one of those kids. I really enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, we, um, we took every opportunity to get into the kitchen, but the, the men in our family are as good cooks and as excited about cooking. Like I can't have my brother in the, in the kitchen with me. Like he's either like he's got command of the kitchen or he just, yeah, you can't compete with him. So um, my mom had a bit of a philosophy and, and good for her for incorporating this. And I'm trying to do that with my own boys is, you know, um, she worked and she couldn't always start dinner at a certain time. And sometimes we cut out of school a lot earlier than when she got home. So her basic rule was to us, whoever got home first had command of the kitchen. Oh, so wow. whoever it was, so if it was my brother, if it was my sister, if it was I, we got command of the kitchen and we got to create. Sometimes, you know, when we were younger, she had to guide us. She'd call us after school and say, okay, so I've got something on the counter. Here's what I need you to do with it. <laughs> she helped us to prep or she'd prep the night before and we'd help her out doing that. So yes, um, we, we were lucky. Um, I had a forum, I guess you could say. I had a platform in which I was allowed to experiment. I was, I was given the opportunity to be in the kitchen. And I think, that's, I think that's the key, right? I think it's if you give your kids um, not only the permission, but the encouragement to be there, um, then they, I, I teach this in my cooking classes all the time. Cause I, I do also teach children and families is when you get children engaged in the kitchen from an earlier age, they be, they not only, I mean, you're, you're developing life skills. That's what you're doing, right? Because you're not only giving them, them the credibility, the confidence, you're making them accountable. So all of a sudden that picky eater is going to say, I made this this is good, you know, and they're going to have buy-in. That's one way to get people, the, the kids engaged, you know, yeah. and then from that, from that, you know, that there's all kinds of other things, right? They, they want to be involved with shopping or you get them involved with shopping, right? Okay. So come with me, choose something we hadn't been, you know, we hadn't done before, find a recipe. It's your night. You know, you, you try and integrate. Yes, there's distractions. I'm not going to lie. My boys aren't always engaged. You know, there's things called screens that hold their attention sometimes a lot longer than I want them to be <laughs> um, focused on. But, um, but at least they have the opportunity to be there. Um, if they make a mistake, it's okay. That's where, that's where you want them to make a mistake so that they learn from that. And so um, I think that's a really good opportunity for kids to understand, well, that's a good way to build that foundation of what is food? What does it do for us? How does it nourish us? How do we make it enjoyable? How do we share it? You know, how do we pass that on? So it starts from that. Yeah. And you know what? It's funny as you're talking, I'm thinking of my own adult children now that are as of this summer, they'll be 30, 27 and 24. Our Incredible. daughter's in New York City and and uh, our oldest son Tim is out in Vancouver and our middle son Matt is in, in Calgary they're actually home right now or uh, they're all going to be home in, in, in a week or so so but oh, anyway they, they often you know they'll I'm always impressed by what they prepare right in terms of meals and they'll send pictures or you know they'll do food prep on Sunday nights for the whole week you know that Amazing. type of thing and it is, you know, and I'll say it is very, very healthy, you know, um, healthy food. You know, it's, it's like you talked about, like the fresh produce and, the, and uh, you know, healthy, uh, very much like the Mediterranean diet. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm sure, you know, you and Barb um, influenced them. I mean, if you didn't set that, I guess, permission to be there and to try it and to experiment and to feel comfortable with it. It's like anything, right? Anything you do in life, you've got to, there's got to be a starting point and we can influence that path. We were, you know, we're probably the very first interaction that they have 
with nutrition comes from parents. So kudos to you and good stuff, you know, to hear that from the kids because it'll set them up re really well for life and for the families that obviously will be inspired by them. Yeah. Well, I'd like to take some credit, but for me, I have to take zero credit. It would be Barb and, uh, <laughs> and the kids but to take it upon themselves, right? They've, they've kind of, don't, uh, they've taken it on to, to prepare that. Like lots of times I'm looking at what they're having and I'm going, how'd you come up with that? Like, it's pretty good. You yeah. Know? And you influence each other, which is, which is nice, which you want in the family, right? Like my son's, you know, at the beginning of this experience they're looking at you know youtube and then it became TikTok, and then you know so um and then we we all share together right and that, and that's i guess if there's you know some positives in terms of social media it is that um we have become a society where we can share our experiences like that and sometimes in a very in a very good and positive way so that we're inspired and encouraged to keep going yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think it's great. I love to see that. And I love to hear that. Um, because, uh, again, it influences other people and it influences their own, their own network. And that's, uh, that's a positive step forward. Well, and I love your subtitle of your uh, book, the healthy Italian cooking for the love of food and family. Like that is, I love that. It's so funny you say that because my book title um, the Healthy Italian was very sort of natural for me, um, even though it was a shift in how I, you know, it, it was me being in front of the, the, the book, uh, telling my story. But the subtitle, I was going to say something like, you know, something really generic, like 150 recipes redone in a healthy way or something like that. And then one day I thought to myself, what's the core of this? Like, why am I doing this? I asked the question. I reversed, you know, I reversed the question and asked myself, why am I doing this? What, what does this book mean to me? And that's what I came up with because yeah. at the heart of it, that's, that was the healthy Italian. Yeah. And, you know, and they're two separate concepts, but it's amazing. It's amazing. And congratulations on weaving them together, like cooking for the love of food. Okay, that could be the subtitle yeah. and cooking for the love of family, right? Could be another. And you brought them very eloquently together. So congratulations on that. Yeah, no, thank you. I, you know what it, it means? It's funny because it means more to me um, every time I revisit it in different ways. And, um, and I think that that's, uh, that's something that has uh guided me in the kind of publicity and the kind of classes that I've taught, for example, the kind of promotions that I did. Um, and I think, I think even to, to your, you know, to your um, book in terms of how you crafted your, your titles, right. Um, they, they spoke to your audience. They spoke to who you are. Um, they really told the story that the, the titles in themselves tell a story, right. And, uh, and that's important when you're getting it out there. Cause sometimes you only have the book, the book title to be able to share that story. You've got like that five seconds to tell people, what is this really about? And, uh, and if you can do it really succinctly and creatively through a title and a, and a subtitle, then sometimes you've won them over. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, as you're saying that, I'm just, you know, you know, the title of mine, it's never too late to be healthy, but the yeah. subtitle is reaching peak health and middle age. And if I compare to what you just said, that's really what the book's about. Like that's, that says what the purpose of the book is. You know? Yeah, no, for sure. And I think, and I think that that's important when you're reaching a core audience, right? Um, the, the audience is exactly that, you know, there's a lot of books out there that profess to help you get healthier and get you on the right path. But yours is a very specific story with a, a very specific focus. And uh, focus, unfortunately, that um, a lot of people haven't discussed, a lot of people haven't focused on, right? It's like, you know, once you reach that middle age, what happens then? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. almost like you're written well, off. You, you, and, go in, you go on medications, basically. I hate to say it, but yeah. And sadly, sadly, that's how it's been. And um, you've changed you know, you've changed that with your story, you know, one story at a time, one book at a time, we're changing that because we are a society that should expect more from our own health and from our, you know, our longevity. 
Um, you know, living, living long is great, but living long and healthy and a more fulfilled life is better. I mean, oh, you, sure. right. So um, I think that's important. I think as we're, as we're living longer lives, we have to make sure that we are set up to live a healthier life. So I, I, I think that's great. Well, and you know what, it's, it's sad, but with, you know, the movement I'll say towards plant-based and vegan, and you can go to A&W and get a vegan burger and all the, the, those types of things, you actually would think we as a society would be becoming much healthier, but it's actually going the opposite. Like it's crazy. Like one out of two people in the U S are either pre-diabetic or diabetic right now. I'm seeing our own Canadian numbers and every year, it's exponentially increasing. And, and so much of it, as I found out the hard way, but so much of it is just what we're putting in our mouths, right? Like it's, you know, non, it's like, we just put, you know, processed and over-processed and, and, you know, kudos to you because that's not what your book's about. Your, your book is recipes about health, like to give you energy, vitality, uh, make you feel better. And that's really what food should be about. You know? hundred, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. You know, things I, I understand people are leaning towards convenience, right? Accessibility. Sometimes it's less stressful, but I always tell people, I give them this analogy, you know, you go through a drive through window, the drive through isn't, you know, the, the, the quickest way to get foods these days. I have to say, I mean, look at the lines. If we want to compare how much more popular they are there, it means that there's longer lines. It can take you 10 minutes, you know, a 10 minute ride back and forth. It's 20 minutes. How many meals do you think you can cook in, in 20 minutes? Uh, quite a few, quite a few, or at least, you know, even if you prep the night before for five or 10 minutes, most meals can be made then. Um, and so there are ways to get convenience, healthy food, I say, um, on the table. And even to that extent, even if it's not cooking from scratch, there's things in the grocery store that can give you a head start. You know, uh, one of the things I do teach is, for example, if, um, you know, people lean on, say when they're entertaining and they're going to the store to cut out or some of the work and entertaining. So they buy those fruit trays and they buy those vegetable trays. They don't spend another minute thinking about that for entertaining, but they never think about that for meal planning. What, you know, what, why not grab that tray of fruit that's already cut up and keep that for two or three days to pack in lunches or you know, snacks in the car, if you're doing a road trip, or just, you know, something to, to basically draw on when you're having virtual meetings, you know, what's wrong with what, why is that uh, not a, uh, something that we invest in, when we're prepping for soups and stews, vegetables already cut, cut up a variety of them. So there, there are can be, and you know, there's, there's pre um, cut foods that are the grocery store is not preparing for us. There's pre-cooked grains. If we want to get a head start, there are ways to make cooking more convenient. I think we just have to, it's a bit of a mindset, right? It's a bit of a shift, right? I think once you start to, to, to teach yourself that this is possible, and once you start making a bit of effort to do so, I think it is possible. Um, I think it's possible for most people, maybe not every night, you know, and that's okay. That but, log gets but down to Mari, you've heard me talk about the 80% rule, right? If you, you think of 80% of the time, if you have 10 servings of food today and eight of them are, are healthy for you and non-processed, that's pretty good, right? I think, so, I think that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And to your point about, you know, some of the convenience foods is, you know, your Wilson shake, right? You want something on the go, you want to pack nutrients and, and great ingredients and a tasty way to get um, uh, fulfillment and nutrition. Why not? Right. Why not something like the Wilson shake? Why not, um, a shake to go? Um, there are ways for sure to make convenience foods accessible, um, without uh, being health unhealthy and having to go through the drive through um, because there are, there are definitely, um, th the one thing that the grocery stores are doing that I'm, I admire is that they are uh, thinking a little bit more creatively. Yes, they have some prepared foods, but um, if you can kind of match that up with some home cooked meals, then at least you feel like, you know, you're getting ahead or you're conquering that whole dilemma of what's for dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure.
you know, and cookbooks and cookbooks help in that regard, right? There's cookbooks, there's apps, there's all kinds of social media engagement that help people do that. And now, as I mentioned before, in the grocery store, you could get almost everything, you know, within for sure three seasons, sometimes even four seasons. So that availability of ingredients um, and that influence even of international cuisine, we're lucky where we are and where we live. Um, the breadth and the depth of that kind of inspiration is all around us. And you just have to, you just have to be open to it and you have to be available, you know, uh, pro you have to approach it in a way that's positive as opposed to looking at it as a chore, which unfortunately sometimes for some people it, it becomes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, and what I'm gathering through this whole podcast is, you know, you're not just your love for cooking, your passion for cooking, but also fun. Like you can, you can tell that you're lighting up when you're talking about your meals or meal prep or cooking. Right. So, I mean, instead of, I think your point's a good one that, you know, often we look at meal prep or getting ready, let's say for dinner tonight as a chore, right. Versus, what creative and what simple things can I look in the fridge and, and take out and, and have a healthy dinner for my family? Yeah. And look, I'm, I'm going to admit there's misses along the way. You know, there's stuff that my friend, my friends and my family, I mean, my friends are probably kinder to me, but my family will say, okay, that's a no. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, I would like to think that most times I hit it, but you know, the, the experimentation is part of the process and you learn along the way. Um, but yeah, I love experimenting. I love getting people to experiment. Um, and I love swapping things in and out. And it's that whole sort of, um, feeling of having found, you know, having uncovered something, um, that I didn't think could work, um, in a, in a meal, right. Swapping out an ingredient or adding in something that was a little bit sort of risque in terms of, you know, the palate. Um, I love mirroring sweet and sour, for example. I have fun with food, like you said. I, it, it, otherwise, what's the point, right? <laughs> yeah, what's the point? I love, I love pairing up ingredients that are a little bit unusual, um, just, just because you know I want to push the boundary. But, but then again, like I, that's my creative outlet, right? For a lot of people, I, I don't. I, I admittedly, for some people, it's not like that. But I think as people become more comfortable and confident in the kitchen. Um, they feel like they, they can, they can definitely play with their food a little bit more and experiment yeah. a little bit more. Well, as you know, in, in my book, we, there's over 30 recipes and I kind of, you know, personally, I thought, ah, oh, there might be the odd person that pays attention to the, the recipes. I'm getting like daily notes, emails, pictures, people sending me pictures of, I had the Wilson shake or I had the vegan mac and cheese or, uh, Matt, uh, my son, Matt, and his girlfriend, Jenny, went to friends of ours out in Calgary. And Matt said, oh, yeah, they had the, they, they had the guacamole. They had, she said, he said the whole book was like tethered of where they marked all their favorite recipes and everything. So I, you know, that's, that was music to me. Yay. Yeah, um, I knew it. I knew it. Listen, at, at the heart, you know, for most people, food is what's going to get them, right? Food is a conversation starter. Um, yes, it's, it's something that obviously fuels us and gives us, you know, lots of great nutrition. Um, but at the heart of things, you know, it, it's a common thread for most people, it's an enjoyment, you know? And so, and I always say the same thing. Like if I remember doing a radio show where people, where a host said to me, Italian and healthy, isn't that an oxymoron? Like, Really? <laughs> Obviously, and I said, never been to Italy. <laughs> right. And I said, no, it absolutely can be healthy and it can be enjoyable. And look, I'm not going to tell you to make something healthier or tell you to swap something out if it's not as tasty. I'm not going to compromise on taste. My family won't let me. Like, honestly, you know, you think my family is going to going to put up with that maybe for one meal. But if that's how I cook and I continue to cook, my family's going to call me on it. So it's got to be as tasty as it is covering off all, you know, checking off all those other boxes. So um, yeah, I, I, it has to be, it has to be something that, um, that connects with, with, with everybody and is an enjoyment for everybody. So that's great. Do you know which recipe primarily you get the most um, compliments on? 
Uh, multiple. And I think, you know, most of the recipes we put in were very simple, simple things to prepare. Um, but, you know, the quinoa burgers, well, a lot of people know I eat that, that stuff anyhow, or the veggie burgers, the mac and cheese, um, mm. even just simple, you know, burritos, like every, like you can have a healthy burrito, you know, but right. people don't realize that. But yeah. Uh, and of course the vegan fudge, that is, that's a the hit fudge. for you. You know what? I haven't made that yet. I'm going to, I'm going to try that. I actually was looking at your book the other day and I'm like, Oh, that's good. I got to try that. That's um, my cheat. You know, my cheat, my vegan fudge. That's my cheat. Do you have that every day? <laughs> Not every day, but no. probably four or five nights a week. I have a little piece of vegan. Good fudge. Job. Good job. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I think you're right. I think sometimes it's the simplest things we never think will really sort of um, hit a lot of people and, and pe people gravitate towards. But I think our lives are so busy, you know, that people do want easy, approachable, and they, and they do lean on those, those comfort foods, right? Um, those comfort foods are, are uh, something that connects with us that I think everybody loves. I mean, mac and cheese, my kids, you know, they, they love homemade mac and cheese and, um, and so I think that's why you're getting a lot of that, that kind of uh, feedback. Yeah, for no, sure. Great, yeah. Great. Well, I'm not sure about you, Fina, but all this talk of food, I am like starving right now. So I'm pretty I hungry too. <laughs> 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 then so, again, I'm always hungry. <laughs> we've been talking about food for, for an hour. So it's a, uh, it's a great topic. And, and I just, you know, love how you brought it all together. And it's not just about the food, it's about the fun and it's about family and it's about, you know, showing your love and appreciating meals and, and appreciating time together. Cause that's really what meals were meant to do, right. To nourish us and bring the family together. And I think, unfortunately, I think with our fast paced world uh, in many cases, we've lost some of that togetherness that, that food can create for us. So yeah, uh, love what you're doing um what's the best way likewise likewise the, yeah what's the best way for people to uh get a hold of your book because i'm sure after uh after we go live with this there will be people asking so what's the best way to get a copy yeah people can check out uh, my website it's uh the healthy italian.ca um there's uh, some links on socials that people can connect to and uh yeah please do check it out and uh, feel free to drop me a line i'm happy to help um, in terms of uh, either people wanting to know more about how to put meals together or how to put a book together. Um, and also, um, if it's a, in terms of book writing, they can also access me uh, through um, Integram.net, which is the company that I'm uh, happy to be partnered with um, in helping small businesses tell their stories, uh, whether it's through books or through their socials or through digital marketing uh, platform um people can check out any of those two sites awesome. and uh check it out yeah awesome and i'll endorse it because uh the help that integram and yourself personally gave uh, gave to me as i said when we started out i don't think this book would be published without you fina so thank you for that thanks and, kevin yeah and thank you so much for uh joining me today on our uh, podcast and uh, look forward to our next uh, chat yeah it was fun thanks so much for having me really appreciate it Thanks, Fina. Have okay, a all the best. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning into our podcast today. For all of our listeners, I invite you to visit advocahealth.com where you can easily become an Advoca member to take advantage of some of the amazing services we offer. You can also access our latest blogs and listen to some of the best medical advice available on our podcast. Don't forget to grab a copy of my latest book, It's Never Too Late to Be Healthy, that is available to order through our website. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.